thank you all for coming on such a discouraging day. It's very windy and cold, uh, as you as you knew before I said so. <laughs> and now I'm wondering if uh, if this magnifies the voice or if it if it's it just sound, a prop. It, sound like it's on. it may be a prop, uh, <laughs> and if. So it doesn't much matter, as long as I uh, project. OK, good. So the thing is that we had a problem getting copies of the books. But we do have copies of, of two other books that I've done. Uh, one is the best American poetry of this year. And one is a, a book called Playlist. And I, I thought I would read a poem from the best American poetry, since they have copies. What's unusual about the 2019 book is that a poem of mine is in it, and I, I didn't allow that to happen since the very first year, but I was persuaded to do so by the year's editor, and I, I'm, glad, I'm glad I gave in. And the poem um, is called, It Could Happen to You. It's June 15, 2017, a Thursday, 40th anniversary of the infamous day, the Mets traded Tom Seaver to Cincinnati, and they're still losing. I mean, we are. Seven to one to the Washington Nationals, a team that didn't exist in 1977, the summer of a little tour in France with Henry James in a yellow Renault Dues, the light a lovely gray, the rain a violin concerto, Prokofiev's number two in D major, and I had books to read. Huxley, Wolf, Forster, and their enemy, F.R. Levis. Empson, a little dull for my taste. Also, Freud on errors. Norman Mailer on orgasms. James Baldwin in Paris. Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, Part One. And John Ashbery tells me he is reading The Possessed, translated as The Demons in the Newfangled Translation, while Ron and I stay faithful to Constance Garnett. I went upstairs, stood on the terrace, ate some cherries, admired the outline of trees in the dark, and Rosemary Clooney sang, It Could Happen to You. And I was a healthy human being, not a sick man, for the first summer in three years. Now, the uh, other book that's available is called Playlist and was written in 58 uh, consecutive days from mid-November to mid-January 2017-2018 in the manner of A.R. Ammons's book, Tape for the Turn of the Year. Of course, he was uh, the poet in residence at Cornell and had written a lot of uh, what, what I call uh, daily poems. So I thought I would read uh, one or two of, of these. Uh, this one was uh, 12 11 17. They, they all have dates for titles. You can tell that the guy who wrote, I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places, was listening to the Langsam last movement of Mahler's Third Symphony at the time, but in a less exalted, though equally schmaltzy mood just as you can be sure that Mahler had Nietzsche on the brain in the fourth movement when the alto asks the deep midnight to speak, and it does. It says the world's pain is deeper than daytime can guess, but pain passes and joy seeks eternity, as do I when I wave my baton. Uh, the other poem... I thought I would read, does mention Archie Ammons as well as John Ashbery, who passed away a few months before my writing this poem. This was 122117. La chute de Rennes is a great French phrase for the curve at the back of a lady's back, excuse me, for the curve at the base of a lady's back, Archie would have approved. After lunch, we'd head to Mayer's smoke shop, and I'd read Barron's while he ambled over to Penthouse. After he found a dime and I three pennies on the corner of Tioga and Buffalo, where the old post office used to be. And later that day, I wrote a poem for John Ashbery. Let's have it, he said. 
Okay, I said, here goes. And John said he liked it, particularly the third line. The poem was two lines long. <laughs> well, uh, the, uh, it's great not to need glasses, but then you need reading glasses. And I haven't figured out how uh, smoothly to transition from one to the other when looking at the audience, because if I look at you wearing these, it's like uh, not having glasses in the old days when I needed to wear them. There's a very complicated syntax for a very, uh, well, very important to me uh, idea. Now, I, I thought I would read a, a few parts of this book, 100 Autobiographies, a Memoir. Uh, it begins with these paragraphs. The title of this book, 100 Autobiographies, was a high-concept prompt in three words. It was Mark Strand's title. He said he hoped to get around to writing a book worthy of it. In 2014, when he was dying of one form of cancer, while I was battling another, he said that I could have the title if he didn't get there first. Mark, a brilliant poet and dear friend, with whom I had collaborated on a number of projects, including the Best American Poetry 1991, died at the age of 80 on November 29, 2014. One week after Mark's death, my heart stopped for a few seconds because something went wrong with the anesthesia following a bad news procedure at the hospital. Chemotherapy, a preferred modern term for the valley of the shadow of death, came next. During my descent into that lonesome valley, I found that writing every day, no matter how bad the pain, was one way I had to keep myself going. Writing was keeping me alive. More, it was asserting my will to live. And now, with the gift of Mark's title, I had a framework and could craft a form for the thoughts dreams, memories, hopes, fears, and fantasies that occupied my mind as I entered the unknown territory from whose bound few travelers would turn. As a patient confined to bed or limited in your mobility, you have a lot of time to think. Some irrecoverable hours are spent watching cable news, athletic events, television shows, old movies. The need to escape is great, and the third or fourth time you see the wild bunch, or double indemnity, is time you won't regret. Still, these are passive activities. How much greater it is to create something out of the debris of one's consciousness, something that is, it is itself a living thing, a book in a form all its own. The ordeal that I endured as a cancer patient was not the only subject that engaged me. Battling a disease that may end your life, you quite naturally take stock. You think about where you've come from, what you've done and not done, whom you have loved, whether you've measured up to expectation, how you have affected the lives of others. In these circumstances, a journal about the present can easily interrupt itself to accommodate a memory or a dream. Well, that's from the preface to the book. I'll just skip to uh, uh, one of the sections. As the title uh, indicates, there are 100 sections, and that gives the author a lot of freedom so that one section could be in uh, uh, a form, like a list. Uh, another section could be a dream. A third could be an anecdote. Uh, and... Uh, this is section 12 with the title, None But the Strong. Dr. Kidder wore his version of a kindly smile. You're in good physical condition, not overweight. Your heart is normal. Your blood pressure is in the safe zone, so we can proceed. He paused. You see, he said, we are going to mount an unprecedented assault on your person. None but the strong can take it. And I'm strong? You are. Except for the cancer, you're in excellent health. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> Except for the cancer, you're in excellent health. 
the student of rhetoric that I am, I thought of Marion Barry, the former mayor of Washington, D.C., who, when asked about criminal activity in the nation's capital, replied, outside of the killing, D.C. has one of the lowest crime rates in the country. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dr. Kidder was joined by Dr. Schultig, his apprentice, and a guest oncologist from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Priyanka, to witness Drs. Schultig and Priyanka compete to win the approval of the older man was like watching two rivals for tenure serve as co-interviewers of the Nobel laureate from Peru, or like Gormley and Garrett vying for Commissioner Reagan's approval in Blue Bloods, an easy TV show to get addicted to when you're flat on your back. The young doctors were taller than Dr. Kidder and leaner and had more hair, and I wondered what in private each would say about the other. Stacy puts her research skills to the test and ascertains that bladder cancer is the sixth most common cancer among men. The biggest risk factor is smoking. It doesn't matter when you quit. But oh, did I love the smell of Galois and Gitan at La Coupole or Le Dome. This is from chapter 21, titled Bladder Cancer. Isn't that what Sinatra died of? Like the march to URBT, the same procedure in May was considered a success. It looked like they got all the bad stuff out of his insides. In the summer, he endured eight weeks of BCGs, an immunotherapy regimen in which a bacillus is injected directly into the bladder. Don't ask how. The patient was still cancer-free in September. This was confirmed by a cystoscopy from the one doctor who insisted on conversing while the procedure was going on. You're good for now, he said, but you could tell a butt was coming. No buts. There's always a chance with high-grade cancer that it will return. But you knew that. And if it does come back, as long as it doesn't penetrate the bladder wall, you're okay. Okay. He was okay. And that summer, he hurried to complete on deadline his book on Frank Sinatra. It was thrilling to write every day. He was on fire. Even when he wrote that Sinatra died of bladder cancer very painfully, he didn't take it to heart. But from time to time, he felt a pain in his midsection, sometimes when walking, sometimes after swimming. And one day in October, he fell down half a flight of steps. At night, he felt fatigued, weak. The cystoscopy revealed the bad news. The tumor had returned and there was no time to lose. A procedure, his third TURBT in nine months, preceded by a CAT scan, took place four days later. The verdict, the cancer had metastasized. They didn't inform him right away. They let his wife bring him the message when he was drugged and drowsy and just regaining consciousness after 24 hours of sheer oblivion. This is uh, part 25. Good show. In the hospital, where he had to spend the next four days, his head was too cloudy for the news to sink in. A few days after his release, the oncologist phoned. With one chemo regimen, the best I can offer you is a 50-50 chance. With the other, there's a very strong possibility of eliminating the cancer totally. Now, which do you want? He sipped from his Starbucks cup, thinking, I expect you to answer in the next 30 seconds because I am about to go on holiday, which I have delayed because, as you see, I have made you a top priority. The patient gave the right answer. Good man. Of course, the side effects are more severe, but it's only four or five months. The patient thought about William Holden in the bridge on the River Kwai, blackmailed by the stiff upper lip British officer to return to the Japanese prisoner of war camp from which he has risked life and limb to escape. As long as I'm hooked, I may as well volunteer, Holden says, and even jokes about the airborne assignment when he is told that he will have to forego the customary practice run before making the jump. With or without parachute, he asks, straight-faced. The British officers laugh, and the commander exclaims, Good show. 
jolly good show. I'm going to read one more section and then ask Stacy uh, to read a section that she wrote. Uh, this section is called Chemo. Uh, as, as you can see, the author refers to himself in the first person sometimes and other times in the third person and other liberties are taken. Uh, chemo. Nothing prepares you for chemo. If you're lucky, you get the benefit of speed for a few hours, but then comes the fatigue, the numbness, the inability to get off the couch, the disgust you feel at the mention of food and nourishment. You can't sleep. You try to read great books, but you can't focus. You try to read your favorite spy and detective novels, but you lose interest. You watch the Knicks blow a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter. You write caustic or clever letters to the editors of the New York Review of Books, protesting an apologist for a forgetful ex-Nazi. The New York Times, defending bow ties as a sartorial accessory. The Wall Street Journal, correcting a statement about the importance of Allied casualties in World War II. Sports Illustrated, remembering Howard Cosell. And The Nation, in which the tagline of an article about Woody and Dylan made you think of Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan rather than about Woody Allen and Dylan Farrow. By writing these letters, you are asserting yourself, saying, I am still alive. Don't count me out. You quote Flaubert from your commonplace book. Saint-Just was a theorist who cared only about the masses but showed no mercy for the individuals. You stop watching the Knicks. You sleep. You get stoned. One day you are living in a secret place somewhere north by northeast of London, working for Allied intelligence and during difficult training sessions, experimenting and being experimented on. You have a wound. There are practical exercises and competitions, like marine boot camp, but with intellectual variations, such as having to learn a language in one week, memorize the periodic table, and cheat at poker you still can't sleep. You watch too much television and hate yourself. You catch your wife sobbing at her desk and you hate yourself. You become a news junkie until you can't stand it anymore and you switch off the set. You hate anchorman jargon, the moral high ground, a slippery slope, the devil in the details, the optics. You, s you observe the studied blandness, the smiles, the helpfulness, while secretly the doctors and nurses and technicians are thinking, we are trying out Gitmo tortures on you. You swing from boredom to belligerence. You rant against genes that are fashionably ripped above the knees, as if to furnish irrefutable sartorial proof that privilege is bad. Didn't they used to call that slumming? You imitate Joseph Cotton as an infirm geezer in a wheelchair, craving a cigar in a rest home, in Citizen Kane, what a tiresome old man I have become. You deliver an impromptu excoriation on the slow but steady decay of cultural values. What have they done to the English language? What happened to honor, dignity, charm, and truthfulness as virtues? You repeat yourself less effectively each time. You write your autobiography, but it is not the authorized version. A lot of it is fake. You tell people you don't miss the taste, you miss the effect of the martinis you are not allowed to drink. They would taste like iron filings. You walk to the local liquor store for recreation and return with bottles of gin and single malt scotch, bottles you will not drink, but touching them will, you hope, give you a contact high. You take out your notebook and write, everything is either unreal or a bad deal and everyone is invisible. The electronic devices that people use have rendered them invisible. As an inveterate magazine junkie, you know that life is dead and time is unreal. Either that or it's not really time. It's a simulacrum, to use the approved academic word, itself a fake, fake and unreal, delusions, contradictions, competitive yoga at equinox. Then the thought occurs to you, I am the one who is unreal. 
I come from a different century, and I miss it, bloody though it was. You stand up too fast, and you get dizzy. You don't want to leave the apartment. You want visitors, but once they arrive, you can't wait for them to leave. You hate yourself. It will never be different. It will always be like this. It is like a snowstorm in Clinton, New York, where Hamilton College is. Clinton, the Versailles of Utica, as the professor of theater and aging dandy put it, folding his hands. It is snowing horizontally. I am not the first person to say so. I am the black swan in the whiteness of February. The snow has whitewashed the truth. The snow has cleansed the dictator's teeth. I walk up the hill in the snow. I get as far as the gazebo before turning back in the snow. The snow has covered the ground. The land is whiter than the white wash of a white woman using powdered white detergent. It has always been snowing. It has never stopped snowing. Well, that's the uh, uh, part about chemo, and I thought I would turn to Stacy and ask her to read the section that she picked out. Thank you. So um, there were a couple of times during David's ordeal when he sort of wasn't there, <laughs> and I thought I could add some additional parts to this book. One of, one of the experiences was particularly harrowing, and I just want to call out Stephanie Green because she really stepped up and helped me. And uh, I'm not going to read about that section. You have to buy the book if you want to know about it. So this describes what happened after David's surgery. He had radical surgery. In addition to removing David's bladder, the surgeon explained that he took out dozens of surrounding lymph nodes. The margins were clear. It's out, he said, referring to the cancer. This happy news would be confirmed by the pathology report. Hours went by uneventfully. My brother-in-law left. My sister would have stayed, but it was past eight in the evening. We're waiting for his room, the receptionist said when I asked about David's status. The room still wasn't ready when the staff changed shift. As far as I could tell, he was still in the recovery room. Had something gone wrong? And why couldn't I be with him? I was alone in the waiting area. Everyone else had gone home. The room was decorated like a cheap chain motel lobby, and the garbage bags overflowed with empty fast food containers and coffee cups. Boxes containing scattered slices of cold pizza covered the counter near the coffee machine. You can wait for him in his room, the OR receptionist said when I next approached her. At last, I thought. She gave me the room number, but her counterpart on the urological floor had no record of David. The nurses wanted me to go home. There's nothing you can do here, they said. We'll let you know when he's released to his room. I took the elevator to the recovery suite, but it was crowded, and I seemed to be in the way, so I took a seat in the corridor. While watching the nurses tend to David, I did something I rarely do. I burst into tears. Why is this happening? Why isn't he in his room yet? Ms. Brady, the patient advocate, went to find out. She returned with a smile on her face, her arms wide, as if she were going to embrace me. He's staying here tonight, she said, in recovery, doctor's orders. She was ebullient. It didn't make sense. What was there to be happy about? Now you absolutely must go home, she said. You can't stay here all night. Why not? And why is he still in the recovery room? It was, I am convinced, by virtue of my hysteria and doggedness that I finally got an answer. Because of the scary heart block of last December when David's heart stopped for a period after surgery, um, the, the cardiologist ordered that David be closely observed through the night. If all went well, he would re be released to a room in the morning. The orders had been in his chart all along, but nobody had told us. Do you work there, the cab driver said, as we headed downtown. No, my husband's a patient. My sister died there, he said, of stomach cancer. He proceeded to tell me about the guilt he still felt because he couldn't pay for the care she needed. Everyone has a cancer story. She also wrote a second uh, section and edited the, the book, and uh, she did all the, uh, all the work of uh, 
listening to what the doctors were saying while I was in Never Neverland half the half the time. Um, this this is a section called Oblivion. The voice asks, "Will I die?" Never allowed even to Stacy. I lie in bed and imagine the world without me. Of course, there are practical things to attend to. Time-consuming papers, financial statements, legal documents, business affairs. How best to take care of my wife and my son. That's the easy part. More difficult it is to ponder the absence of myself from the world. How short is our collective memory. I think of gaudy poets dead and now nearly forgotten by all but a handful of Ph.D. candidates. How swiftly the absence swallows us. The forgotten man that FDR remembered in his dynamic first term is overlooked because he is one of the powerless many, because there is nothing distinctive about him, and because, as Jesus says, the poor we shall always have with us. But the beloved absent friend is forgotten simply because he or she has disappeared. The concept of my absence defeats all philosophy. I cannot grasp it. Oblivion. I thought I understood it pretty well when I read Dickinson and Frost, but the deaths of friends feel more like disappearances than deaths. In the old days, before I got sick, I might, if lucky, run into the ghost of one or another pal as I walked in a familiar garden or park, and sometimes I still view the familiar features of a friend of long standing, though usually from a distance, with no chance to have a conversation with her or him. And I wonder whether there will be some who feel my ghostly presence after I've gone, and for how long. It keeps me awake some nights, oblivion, the end of consciousness, impossible to conceive. Though each time they give me a general anesthetic, I learn a little more about the way it works. There is this to be said about general anesthesia. It lessens the fear of death. This is, section is called the Rebbe, which is a, a Yiddish term for a rabbi of high distinction. On my third day after radical surgery, I met the Rebbe. In what language do you prefer to speak, he wanted to know. He was fluent in Yiddish, Hebrew, English, and I suspect Russian and French. In Yiddish, we do not have a word for this disease, he said. What do you call it, I asked. We call it the disease we are forbidden to name. I had a private room so Stacy could stay with me round the clock. She slept in a fold-out cot. After the surgeon's morning rounds, she left for our apartment downtown to shower and change. Having been poked and prodded by a parade of doctors, nurses, aides, I was usually asleep by the time she returned. On this day, she shook me out of my morphine-induced fog. There's a minion on the other side of the floor, she told me. Let's take an old-fashioned walk. If I wanted to be released from the hospital, I had to be able to circumnavigate the floor at least ten times. Don't fade into the sheets, the surgeon said. I shuffled around the corridor attached to my IV pole, nodding in solidarity to other patients engaged in the same ballet, all wearing the same threadbare hospital gowns, unselfconscious about the open backs that revealed pale, flabby buttocks. We pass the nurse's station where, depending upon who is working, I may get a good for you or even a little flirtatious banter with Nurse Engel, my favorite. Then comes the hot blanket station, a glass-fronted cabinet stacked with coverlets. Hospitals are cold in every sense, and those warm blankets are a machaya, which is Yiddish, for a bucket of ice water on a hike in the scorching Negev desert. It takes a while to complete a circuit of the floor, with each step seeming to require a separate act of will. Just after the third right-angle turn, I pass the hospital room of Rabbi Aharon Eliezer Seitlin, who, I learned, had been flown in from Israel with all his family thanks to donations from Hasidic communities around the world. A group of bearded Hasidim in their white beards, black suits, black hats, and prayer fringes 
stood around speaking in low tones. Themselves rabbis of note, they had come from various cities to show their respect, to pray with the famous Rebbe, and to hear what he would have to say. Like me, Rabbi Seitlin was hooked up to an IV pole. Though gaunt, he was a large man. He wore wire-rimmed glasses that did nothing to diminish the bright intensity of his dark brown eyes. He bade me join the group in prayers. Someone found me a seat. Stacy held back, knowing the orthodox custom of separating men from women, but they waved her in. She introduced herself with her Hebrew name, Shoshana. The day happened to be the yard site of the greatly revered Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the last Rebbe of the Lubavitcher Hasidic dynasty, so the rabbis were davening with particular fervor. In 1976, Rabbi Schneerson had handpicked the young Rabbi Zeitlin to be an emissary to Israel. It was an inspired choice. Over the years, Rabbi Zeitlin worked tirelessly to promote Jewish education. He established a network of Chabad kindergartens, 34 in all, serving 1,500 children in the ancient city of Safed. Someone lent me a yarmulke and a talis. We chanted Mincha. Then Rabbi Seitlin delivered a commentary. He told of a wealthy man who came to the rabbi for advice. The man, a congregant who gave generous sums for tzedakah, or charity, wanted to know whether he was, quote, on the right level in his relationship with God, on the right level. The rabbi couldn't help laughing at the phrase, and I joined in the laughter, loudly. What did the rabbi tell the man? He told the man that he should wake up tomorrow, go to work, do your duty, observe the commandments, spend time with your family. That was the first time you've laughed in I don't know how long, Stacy said later. He got it, the rabbi announced to the room when I laughed with him, and I still think the anecdote is hilarious, though it mystifies every friend with whom I've shared it. Later, when we were alone, Rabbi Seitlin wanted to know how I made a living. I told him I was the author of books, and you can make a living doing that. <laughs> he complimented me on my Hebrew, rusty as it is, and patiently corrected each error of pronunciation I made as I read a prayer. He shook my hand. In that hospital room, I felt I was in sacred space. The next day, the rabbi's son visited me in my room. My father would like you to pray with him, he said, and if it isn't something you want to do for yourself, it would still be a mitzvah for you to let him pray with you. I went. I didn't have tefillin, uh, phylacteries is, is the term for it. Uh, so Rabbi Zeitlin let me wear his. I asked about his condition, and he asked about mine. The waiting is difficult, he said. Even Moses complained about having to wait. A little longer, and they will stone me, Moses said. The Rebbe told me about the legendary Reb Levick, the spiritual leader of a great Hasidic community in an unpronounceable Ukrainian city. A stranger entered Reb Levick's shul, and when he looked to his right, he saw everyone rise. Then he looked to his left, and the same thing happened. The stranger was astonished. Then he saw Reb Levick himself, not an assistant or a functionary, mind you, but the great Reb Levick himself stride down the aisle to hand him a siddur, a prayer book. The congregation had stood in honor of the beloved rabbi, but some of that honor was meant for the stranger. The Yiddish neshama, Rabbi Seitlin said, knowing that Jewish soul could not convey the import of that Yiddish phrase. This was in June, the third of Tammuz in the Hebrew calendar. On October 15, Rabbi Aaron Eliezer Zeitlin passed away. Uh, part 64. I, I wanted to say that I've written a, uh, I was so inspired by Rabbi Seitlin that I've, I've written a, a short story uh, dedicated to him, and, uh, and I sold it to the New Yorker. So I'm very pleased about that, and, uh, and it's in, in memoriam uh, to him, and Uh, and uh, sort of picking up the same theme in the next section that I'll read, uh, what I've not read are the autobiographical sections, that is, uh, 
uh, I've read mainly about the experience of being in doctor's offices or in hospitals, but there are a lot of sections of memory of uh, important things that happened, uh, what it was like to uh, visit Yale with my father when I was thinking of applying to colleges, for example. And this section, the time is the late 1960s, and uh, the war in Vietnam was going on, and I was subject to the uh, conscription. So this chapter is called Shalom Aleichem Rides to the Rescue. Um, the question was, how are you going to get out of the draft? In my senior year of college, I had a low draft number in the lottery and was nervous about having to go to Vietnam. Morris Simon, father of Rochelle, the curly-haired brunette on whom I had a crush, was considered the wise man of the synagogue and it was to him that my father suggested I go to for advice. Mr. Simon was the head of the temple's Hevra Kedisha, which undertook the community's funeral arrangements and cemetery maintenance. After I had my say, he made this cheerful little speech. There's really nothing to worry about, he said. You have to go to the army. Well, one of two things will happen. Either you'll be sent to Vietnam, or you won't. If you're not, what's there to worry about? But let's say they send you to Vietnam. One of two things will happen. You'll get a cushy desk job in Saigon, or you'll go to the front. If you get the desk job, there's nothing to worry about. But even suppose they volunteer you into the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and God forbid they send you to the Mekong Delta as part of Operation Marauder, and there are two short artillery rounds, and you get wounded, and the helicopter comes for you, one of two things will happen. Either you'll recover, or you won't. If you recover, what's there to worry about? But even suppose you don't recover, one of two things will happen. You'll be buried in hallowed ground like a good Jewish boy, or you won't. If you're buried in hallowed ground, what's there to worry about? But even suppose you're not buried in hallowed ground. Well, Mr. Simon paused. Well then, my dear fellow, you're in one hell of a fix. <laughs> Here's a section called No Regrets. No Regrets. Great song as the young Billie Holiday did it in the 1930s, and I heard it 40 years later. No Regrets and no use complaining. Still, I could kick myself for not taking Philosophy 101 with Arthur Danto and the sequence courses in 18th century and Victorian literature. I wish I had taken a second year of German and an extra semester or two of French conversation. No question I should have spent the summer after junior year in Paris, as Paul Starr did. Both of us had received summer travel stipends. I picked Oxford, which had its pleasures, though it was futile to try to recapture the joys of the previous summer spent in that enchanted place. But I have no real regrets. I don't regret my PhD, but I almost do. I regret losing my temper in 1969, 1973, 1980, 1989, etc. I regret it that in 1971 a barmaid at Cambridge's Baron of Beef pub lost her job because I flirted with her. In my room she cried, but I could do nothing to help her. Do I regret dating X or breaking up with Y or being hurt and causing pain? No, but I regret not making a pass at M-A-R-N-S-E-P-T-N-B when I could tell they wanted me to do so. I don't regret sleeping in the same bed with T, P, N, G, and J, though we were chased and kissed but didn't touch. Do I regret the time I wasted when I had time to waste? I do not. Do I regret leaving the dorm and living with my parents' sophomore year? I do not. I don't regret any romantic relationships, except maybe two of them. <laughs> Nor do I regret the summer of 1973 at the Art Colony in Cummington, Massachusetts, where William C Cullen Bryant was born. It was a democratic place, and the people weren't getting any work done, which they blamed on lunch. So at one of the weekly meetings that drove me nuts, they eliminated lunch, which totally pissed off the chef, 
who felt that they were dissing him, so he quit. I slept too late for breakfast, and the do-it-yourself lunches consisted of unappetizing peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, so I shed ten pounds and went skinny dipping with Tom and Kate and Tom's sister when I wasn't reading Jane Austen and Delmore Schwartz or walking in the woods and the nearby graveyard. Ron drove up with a, for a visit with Kathy. I met Adele Gladstone, who made a black and white drawing of me that I have framed in Ithaca. When I came back to New York that August, I weighed 149 pounds, my lowest since college, and I splurged on a beautiful blue trench coat at Paul Stewart. I regret my lack of confidence when I started at Newsweek. I wish I had been more relaxed, happy-go-lucky, punning away, having a good time. I had not wanted so badly to succeed at something since Columbia. Also, I should have visited Fürth, the small town in Bavaria where my father grew up. There are two other things I regret, but they will go unnamed, not because they are so shameful, but because I believe that mysteries are sacred. I do not regret the year I gave in to anxiety and fear. I was lovesick, which was even worse than homesick, but I had Baudelaire and Poe to comfort me. It was the year Nixon resigned, and Maurice Gerodius published a book called President Kissinger, and twice a week I had to figure out how to teach freshman English at Columbia. Only after you do it do you realize that no one has taught you how to do it, in which sense teaching resembles journalism and nearly every other activity worth doing. There was a night when I, drunk, left 40 bucks on a $60 tab, and Stacy said it didn't matter because you never regret over-tipping, and she was right. I have never regretted over-tipping. I regret gaining 10 pounds when I stopped smoking, but I took them off playing tennis and swimming. I regret losing some of my pocket notebooks and hope a few may still turn up. And I regret not shaving off my mustache before I finally did it in 1978 in Ashokan. Why did I buy shares in that solar energy s startup in 1981? <laughs> Why did I waste a summer afternoon in 1976 playing golf badly at Ham Hamilton College? I don't know, but I don't regret the swimming pool in Vence on a summer evening when everyone was 28 or 29. I regret using semicolons in my prose when I started out. <laughs> and I regret giving a bad review to certain books of poetry in 1972. But these, except for the mustache and the failure to visit Fiert, are minor things. I have no real regrets. Kierkegaard says, marry or don't marry, you'll regret it either way, <laughs> which is profound, though I am married, and I don't regret it. Nor do I regret the nights we spent listening to Edith Piaf sing, Je ne regrette rien. 96, The Secret. I split open a green Calmerna fig and saw the secret of the universe. To be in a hotel room with you when one of us knows the secret and whispers it in the other one's ear is to give in to temptation, and there is joy in the afternoon. Get old. Feel generous. Take a breath of good, clean country air. Water the plants. Prune the hedges. You have learned the secret. She asked him, why did you sign your name in pencil? He answered, so you can erase it. Do not keep the secret to yourself, but know that you will divide it in half the moment you share it with someone else. Drunk, he tried to act sober, but she wasn't having any of it. When he collapsed, she had to undress him and move his dead weight into the bed. Nevertheless, she forgave him because she was in on the secret, like a hurricane. I said health was like peace, something we take for granted until and unless we're at war. The doctor nodded, but his simile beat mine. The medical establishment treating cancer is like a vengeful spouse who makes your life so miserable you agree to leave her. Then he says, like a hurricane, she comes wet and wild and takes your house when she goes. At long last, the correct diagnosis of the gastrointestinal woes that have plagued me ever since the surgery has been revealed. I have celiac, for which the only cure is strict adherence to a gluten-free diet, and at the moment nothing in New York is more fashionable. Tennis great Novak Djokovic is on a gluten-free diet. I have had 10 months of misery, 
One test after another has failed to diagnose the problem. I have been treated for an evil condition called C. diff and other things, but there were false positives and other mishaps, and only now do I undergo the endoscopy that will confirm what the blood test indicated. You have a textbook case of celiac, the doctor says. So what do I do? You give up wheat and rye and beer and bread and pastry and cereal and other things you don't care about, but eat all the natural produce you want, and in no time you'll start to feel better. Gluten is the culprit. Glory be to God. Now, what other part of my body is crumbling? My back, my lower back, on the right side of my body. No cure but massage therapy and swimming will help. The massage therapist says, the center of tension is your glute. There's that word again. <laughs> Here are the last uh, sections. <clears throat> 99, champagne cocktails. Ah, July, food tastes like itself. The pure produce of America is fresh, a bounty of berries, cherries, a cantaloupe with port wine in the hollow, and I've renewed my taste for cocktails, the standard martini in Manhattan, the historic Lucien Godin, and the complicated concoctions that a good bartender will come up with. For every summer of my adult life since 1990, there is a drink. One summer it was the daiquiri, another year it was white peach sangria and bellinis. This summer I have dedicated to champagne cocktails and the sparkling white wines of the Finger Lakes, such as Chateau Franc Brut, Dr. Constantine Franc, Méthode Champenoise, 2009. As far as I'm concerned, champagne cocktails can give summer afternoon a run for the money as the sweetest two-word phrase in the language. For the first time in three years, I don't wake up feeling sick, dreading the day. I have color in my face, and though I'm 25 pounds lighter than I should be, that's just as well. The strength is returning to my arms, my legs. I feel my shoulders expand with every stroke when I swim. My legs hurt the next morning, but it's a good feeling. Muscles unused are springing back to life. It is not as though I have no pain. Every day, there is pain. My feet hurt. When I stand too fast, I get dizzy. I am prone to vertigo. And if I eat the wrong thing, my body rebels at 3 or 4 in the morning. My skin itch itches like hell where the prosthesis fits. And then there is the worry that it will fail, as has happened, embarrassingly. But this is pain I can live with. I've been saying it all along with bravado, but today I mean it. I am going to live. Like all cancer patients, I know that this is just a reprieve, temporary, and subject to sudden reversal at any time. We are like middleweights, obliged to defend our championship belts every three months. But it feels so good in the heat of July to stand up straight and tall and walk across the garden like a man who is going to live. The sun warmed my body after I swam for 25 minutes in a blue pool some 15 feet deep. I used to like diving into the pool. Can't do that anymore. Today I love feeling my shoulders, my arms, my belly, my legs as I swim vigorously in the sun. May it always be summer. The Cancer Research Center gets in touch. In 100 words or less, what five things would you tell someone who is diagnosed with bladder cancer? Always bring a trusted companion to every medical appointment. You will not be able to remember everything you hear. Confirm all appointments. No matter how well run the hospital is, there are always emergencies, scheduling errors, or failures of communication. We drove 250 miles for a procedure only to be told that it had been canceled. Plan on winning the battle, but prepare your mind for the worst. Even on bad days, there are pleasant hours. You can do it. You can take it. It is amazing how much pain the body can withstand. I want to keep it positive, though I know there will be days, especially in the cold weather months, when one or another souvenir of my ordeal will flare up and make it difficult to get out of bed in the morning. Depression, big time. But as Porgy says in the Gershwin song, no use complaining. Got my gal, got my lord, got my song. 
Even on days when I ache, I take pleasure in walking up or down a flight of stairs, knowing there may come a time when I will no longer be able to do so, and recalling how, as a little kid, I learned to climb one step at a time, and then found I could manage it with one foot per stair rather than two. My family lived on the third floor, and some days I would walk up the stairs to the fourth floor just for the pleasure of walking up and down an extra flight of stairs. Two cups of coffee, and I'm in a state of exalted nervousness. On the radio, Tommy Dorsey, Boogie Woogie, 1943, Chick Webb, Blue Moon, B. Wayne, Lee Wiley looking at you, Duke Ellington in a sentimental mood, and Ella and Lewis are putting all their eggs in one basket. I'm betting everything I've got on you. May the music of the 1940s last forever. Odd Notes. Cancer is the alien in the Sigourney Weaver horror movie franchise. The 1960s advertisement for Terryton cigarettes showed a man or a woman with a black eye and a tagline in defiance of correct grammar. Us Tarryton smokers would rather fight than switch. I didn't think of it at the time, but it now it seems obvious that the sentence means I'd rather get cancer than stop smoking. The shiner, too, is significant. It is like Moshe Diane's eye patch, very virile. That's why Stan, the art director in Mad Men, has a poster of Diane on his bedroom wall. My old idea, cigarette brands named after all the astrological signs, Gemini, Leo, Virgo, Scorpio, Capricorn, Aries et al., except for cancer. I can make that joke. I'm in excellent health. Thank you. This was it, was it liberating to write all the short chapters so that you could, I mean, you could do each one in any style or voice or approach you wanted? Yes, I had a wonderful time. It was an activity that uh, meant that I, I, w I was still al alive and uh, functioning as a, uh, as a citizen or as, as, a, as a human being at the worst of times. And I also did not miss a deadline. I, I had a weekly deadline uh, during this entire time. And I, I had to take three months, uh, July, I had to take three months off. But otherwise, I, uh, I missed uh, not a deadline. Um, I, 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 I like writing, is, is, is the point. And I think Freud is right that work gives a, a meaning to your life. Um, and, and writing, I do think, is an assertion of identity and, and will. Uh, and uh, uh, it was just something I, I didn't, something I recommend, even if you're not a writer, if you wind up in this, uh, in this disagreeable situation, uh, which I was in, where uh, there, was, uh, you know, there were all sorts of tortures that... Uh, that you uh, you go through. What advice would Stacy give to the caregivers of the loved one? You have a loved one who has cancer. Oh, <laughs> go to the cancer resource center would be one. That was they were a great support for me. I think the advice is to uh, uh, I didn't always follow it, but it's very important to take care of yourself and to um, you know to make sure that you stay healthy yourself. She, she has also written that um, uh, be sure to pack, uh, if, you're, if you're going to accompany a patient, pa pack your gear, pack an overnight yeah, have a go bag. Have a go bag. I, never, I never realized how important that was until David had a, a real crisis and we had to go to the hospital and I was wearing a sundress and flip-flops mm -hmm. and that turned into four days in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, yeah, if I had just had a bag with everything I might need to grab, I would have been a little less hysterical, I think. So, yeah, that's good advice. So, th thank you very much. I, I hope if you like the book, you will notice that it was published here in Ithaca by Cornell University Press. Uh, the editor-in-chief uh, of whom, uh, of which is here, uh, as are various staff members, and I think they did a fine job on the book, and, uh, and I'm very grateful to, to them for, for publishing it, and uh, 
and grateful to you for coming and if you buy the book for that as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>